Hello, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to everyone joining today's Ask WHO session on COVID-19. As usual, I'm joined by Dr. Mike Ryan and Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove. So if you have questions about COVID-19, epidemiological situations, variants, response, where are we in this emergency, uh, please um, send us your questions if you're watching us on Twitter using the hashtag AskWHO. If you're watching us on other platforms, please use the comment section. My colleagues behind the scenes will send me and I will pass those questions to Mike and Maria. Um, good afternoon, Mike, Maria. Thank you for your time today, as, as always. Uh, we're seeing some fresh news uh, today and yesterday that some countries are announcing that the pandemic phase is over. Um, so can we maybe explain what does that mean? What are they saying? And is, isn't this something that we're trying to do actually on global level? Maria, maybe you can start. Uh, yeah, so no, it, it, um, I think what we recognize is that um, at a global level, we're still very much in the middle of this pandemic. We're still dealing with this pandemic virus, but countries are at very different stages um, of where they are in dealing with this virus. And the reason that they're at different stages is because they have um, different access to tools. Um, population level immunity is increasing around the world and it's really quite high because of vaccination rates that are increasing around the world. However, the vaccination rates are not reaching the same levels in all countries because we don't have vaccines in all countries, and in particular, vaccination amongst those who are most at risk, people over the age of 60, people with underlying conditions, our frontline workers. Um, but countries have, um, because they're in different stages, they've used tools differently, they've had access to different stool, tools, and they're seeing different profiles of, of, of impact. Um, on the positive side, many countries are seeing a significant decline in hospitalizations and in mortality. And that's what we want to see. That's a very positive sign that these tools that we have are working. Um, on the other hand, other countries don't see that same level of impact because again, they don't have those vaccines. So while some countries may be um, in a different phase where the emergency that they are dealing with is not at that same level of intensity, we are definitely not seeing that across all countries. And so for us, what is really important is that we find ways to balance the response of dealing with this virus while keeping people alive and keeping getting their livelihoods back on track. So it's a difficult message because everyone wants to hear that the pandemic is over. We do as well. None of us want to be talking about the pandemic or this virus anymore. We want to be in a situation where we can manage COVID-19. And what I mean and what we mean by managing COVID-19 is that it is a disease that doesn't kill like it is killing right now. Um, the virus and the variants um, and I just want to mention the variants because this is, a, this is a point of uncertainty for us in terms of where we are. We have Omicron, and we'll talk about this, I know, a little bit later. Um, but the virus is still evolving. The virus is changing. And so all countries have to be agile um, and ready to deal with what may come next. We don't want everyone out there to have to worry about it every single day. There's many public health professionals that are dealing with that. But it's not over. Um, but we definitely are in a different stage. And what are your thoughts on those news or developments in certain countries? Um, I think, uh, I, I really repeat what you said, Maria. I mean, we all want to be done with this, but unfortunately, it's not done with us quite yet. Um, I, uh, I, I see that people are using different words, and, and I, sometimes it's lost in the translation of those words through the media and through to the press. I, I think countries are trying to make a transition to a more sustainable way of managing COVID, avoiding lockdowns, uh, integrating some of the work. So, for example, integrating testing into their normal laboratory testing approach, <clears throat> integrating the care of people with COVID into the care of people with other respiratory diseases. So making the whole process of managing COVID more sustainable. But that doesn't mean not trying to stop the virus, that doesn't mean stopping testing, and that certainly doesn't mean uh, not providing good clinical care to people who get this disease. This disease can still kill. So our ability to save lives and prevent disease still exists. Our ability to diagnose and track the virus still exists. We don't, should not give up that ability just because we don't want to recognise that COVID is still here. And, and I do think, looking at the various language I'm seeing from the European Union and others, when you actually read the language, Overall, these strategies are, are, are logical. 
you can interpret certain words uh, and then the headline is, oh, European Union abandoned strategy for controlling COVID. This, that's not the case at all. Uh, so I do think we need to be careful when we read these uh, uh, documents or press releases or when we uh, read the newspapers or the social media to, to be careful. People aren't abandoning that. Uh, Maria, you said it yesterday at a press conference and I think again today, the biggest uh, challenge we face right now is that if we lose sight of the virus and we stop testing and particularly stop sequencing this virus, then we could be in real trouble because uh, flying blind is not what we want to do in this pandemic. So that ability to continue doing testing, to, and I can see some countries again and the European Union plans to do this as well, is to move towards sentinel testing and I, I don't know if everyone out there understands what, what, what that is but it means not having to detect every case. And it's a bit like, um, I was trying to think of an analogy the other day when I was speaking to someone, it's, you know when you have weather stations in a city, you don't have a weather station in every garden measuring the wind speed. What you have is a weather station every few blocks or in every community. And then what you do is you fill in the gaps. So what you do is you measure the wind speed in in suburb X and the wind speed in town Y and then you say the average wind speed for the whole area is this or the weather is worse in one place than the other. You don't need to do it in every single field in every single garden to be accurate. What you need is a minimum number of observations so that you can say what the weather is and we need the same in COVID. We need to have enough good points of observation where we collect really good data and that's why the, the system we've been using for many many years in influenza in terms of uh, influenza-like illness surveillance, surveillance of acute respiratory infections, systematic testing of a subpopulation of people, and systematic genetic sequencing of those is going to be crucial going forward. So we need to, yes, transition maybe from having to test every single case because there just uh, isn't the desire to do that anymore. But going from testing everyone to testing nobody is, is really silly, really, really silly. Uh, and it will be very counterproductive because it will make us blind at the very moment that we need to be really aware that this virus is still out there. That doesn't mean that everyone shouldn't get on with your lives. Please, if you're vaccinated and you're living in a country with a strong health system, you can get on with your life. But if you're someone with an underlying condition who hasn't been vaccinated and your health system in your country is not strong and access to health care is not easy, there's still a significant risk of this disease damaging you and your family. So it's not the same for everyone everywhere. So just because the weather's good in one part of the world doesn't mean it's good everywhere. So please don't, let's not project success uh, and, and, and declare victory uh, in a fight before it's actually over, because it, it isn't over. But at the same time, we, I really don't want people to feel that at the end of two and a half years, we're where we were before, we're not. We're so much better off than we were before. We know so much more about this virus. We know how to prevent it, we know how to treat it, we know how to sequence it, we know how to track it. We know the enemy now. Uh, and what we really need to do is just keep focused on, on the actions that will continue to make this virus go away. Mm -hmm. I think this is a really important, I think this is sort of the crux of exactly where we are in, in this pandemic and the narrative. And it's, it's very difficult to explain. It's a very critical moment in this pandemic because there's so many opposites that I see. Like, we, we, we want the pandemic to be over, but it's not. We don't want to talk about the pandemic, but we need to. Um, we're frustrated by the fact that, you know, we still have to deal with this, but we're hopeful because we have all of these tools. There's a juxtaposition there to be able to discuss this. And I think we need to celebrate the successes. So I think, you know, when, you, when these questions are asked to us, people say, well, aren't they wrong to say this? Aren't they wrong? We need to celebrate where the systems are working. We need to celebrate the efforts that have been put into place. Our caution, our concern is where we are seeing that success turn into dismantling systems, breaking down those systems that, that countries have worked so hard to put in place. Workforce, surveillance, testing, sequencing, clinical care, a respected, a protected, health workforce with proper personal protective equipment. Let's celebrate those successes where mortality, morbidity is declining. This is what we expect two and a half years into a pandemic, but it's not the same everywhere. So while we can, we can recognize that countries are in different stages of the pandemic, as Mike has just said, it's not the same everywhere else. And we cannot ignore 
what's happening in other countries where they don't have access to vaccines, where people are dying unnecessarily. And people are dying unnecessarily in high-income countries too. If you actually look at vaccination coverage and look at the percentage of vaccination coverage in over 80, in over 70 year olds, in over 60 year olds, look at the vaccination coverage percentage of those who have underlying conditions, and look at the vaccination coverage among health workers. It varies drastically around the world, including within high income countries, middle income countries. So find a way when we talk about this, let's, let's, let's move our narrative along as well, celebrate the successes, recognize that it's not everywhere, and really fight like hell to ensure that everybody else has the same access to these tools. That's what the DG has been talking about. That's what Mike has been talking about, myself, and many, many others. We can change the course of this, and that's what we're doing. So our strategic preparedness and response plan that's been adjusted is exactly that. How do we end the emergency, not just in high-income countries, but everywhere, and we give everybody the same ability to survive, the same ability to get back to their lives. So I, I do feel like we're at a really pivotal moment that's confusing, um, and so the people that are out there, they need to know what to do. There's information for you to keep yourself safe. Continue to wear that mask when you're around others, when you're indoors. Continue to open the windows. Continue to be careful and cautious. We've been saying, know your risk, lower your risk. That's still true. We also need governments to have policies in place to support people to do so. So it's not just one or the other. Um, but we, we have a ways to go, but it doesn't mean that we're in the same difficult position that we are in the, in the beginning. As Mike has just said, we have tools. We need to use them appropriately. Thank you both. And we're already receiving quite a lot of follow-up questions. So maybe I'll take this one from Julie Taylor first. Um, she says, I agree it is challenging managing from country to country. The virus and the variants are difficult, but can we please also consider the impact this is having for those of us with long COVID? Mm -hmm. Two years in with life impacting and changing mm -hmm. issues. That impacts on countries, workforce and economy. It all needs to be addressed under the pandemic umbrella. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, and, and this is what we uh, you know, are trying to articulate. It's not just the pandemic, it's not just this virus, it's not just the acute effects from it. Um, you know, all of our future scenarios that we think about in terms of what may happen with this pandemic, all of these future scenarios, all future plans need to take into consideration long COVID, post COVID-19 condition, because this is significant. And, you know, there's a lot of work that is underway. There are a lot of studies that are coming out. There's a lot of advocacy and research and rehab. And we are learning about this. We don't have the full picture of this yet. What we can say with certainty is that future plans need to take into consideration managing people who are dealing with post-COVID-19 condition, as well as ensuring that we get livelihoods back on track and that people receive the care that they need for whatever disease they face, that they get vaccines that can prevent disease. There's been a significant alteration in terms of people's ability to access care and to get the care that they need. And this will have a long-term effect as well. People's mental health we can talk about. So it isn't just dealing with this, this one pandemic. And again, this is kind of what I was meaning by this balance of getting it, getting it right moving forward. Use the tools most appropriately, get lives back, back in order, but don't dismantle the systems that will not just help for COVID, but all of these other diseases. And it also speaks to the fact that um, SARS-CoV-2 causes a disease that we've named COVID-19. It's the disease uh, that it causes. But within that, for the vast majority of people who get COVID, and this is the case with many viral uh, infections, uh, people have either very mild or no symptoms or a, they have a, the sniffles or the cough or they have a sore throat. They have the classic upper respiratory uh, syndrome uh, and uh, uh, really recover within a few days and move on with their lives. And, yeah, nothing to see here in that sense. Um, but if the virus, uh, uh, if a person with an underlying condition, a person in a very old age group, a person with vulnerabilities is exposed to that same virus, there can be very dire consequences for that immediately and in the long term. And what we increasingly see with COVID is even in perfectly healthy people who don't necessarily have a severe infection the first way around, what we've seen is that COVID-19 is a much more generalized systemic disease. In other words, it's not just a disease of the throat and the nose and the thing. For most people, that's what they experience. But for some people, this is quite a systemic disease. 
and it causes broad-based inflammation in blood vessels all over the body. Um, and uh, in that sense, it's what we would call a, 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 an immunomodulated uh, reaction. In other words, it's not necessarily the virus causing all of that inflammation. The body is constantly reacting to the presence of pathogens. We're sitting here today, we're surrounded. If you swab my throat, you find all kinds of bugs and pathogens. Uh, we're in a kind of a, a dynamic balance with nature. Uh, we have a, a very positive biome in our guts that actually protects us. The, the pathogens actually protect us, nourish us, make sure we get the right vitamins. We have the same in our respiratory tract. We have a natural ecosystem on our skin, in our respiratory tract, in our guts. Uh, and that can become uh, disrupted uh, for any kinds of reasons, stress, lack of sleep. So we're in a kind of a balance with our own bugs all the time. Um, and very often when we're exposed to a new pathogen, for most people, our immune system reacts very well and deals with it. For a small proportion of people, the immune system can overreact or react dysfunctionally to the presence of a virus. And it can actually mount a huge response and produce all kinds of inflammation. Because it feels, it's like, in other words, it sets off the alarm in the system. And instead of like a small alarm going off, the whole system lights up. And you can end up with a very, very generalized sort of inflammatory response. And it can affect organs like the heart, like blood vessels, like the, the brain. Uh, and we don't know how long it takes for that inflammation. Because inflammation means damage. You know when you talk about inflammation, something is inflamed and we're always worried, am I going to have a scar? Well, scar tissue forms where you've got you know, tissue that's been inflamed and it heals, but it doesn't heal perfectly. So that's what we're worried about with COVID, long COVID condition, is that this process that occurs in otherwise perfectly healthy people leads to a longer process of inflammation. Uh, and then, therefore, potentially a much longer process of recovery. And what we don't understand is whether there's any residual permanent damage to people's um, immune systems, to people's cardiovascular systems, to people's um, neurologic systems. And that's what we don't know enough. Uh, it's still, and it's not something to be scared of for the vast majority of people. This is a very mild infection or a moderately mild infection. There are two groups of individuals, as I said. There are those groups of individuals with underlying conditions, hypertension, diabetes, very old age, immunosuppression, who can have an immediate, very severe um, infection, and they can do very badly because their systems are already compromised. And we can have this overreaction in perfectly healthy people who should otherwise do very well, but they get this much more intense response to the virus being present. Um, uh, their immune system is hypervigilant and overreacts. And there are another group of people who we now have to, and when you count the number of cases we've had globally, uh, if only a tiny fraction of people have post-COVID condition, that's going to be millions of people in the long run, because so many people have been exposed to this virus. So I agree with uh, Julie, I don't know if Julie is someone that suffers from this herself, but she's absolutely right. Because when everyone on the planet has effectively been exposed to the same virus, you only need a tiny proportion of people to have post-COVID condition, and you have a serious problem on your hands for the health systems going forward. So we need to understand this much better. We need to find ways of how we're going to therapeutically uh, um, treat people to get rid of these symptoms and to ensure that people recover fully. Um, and, uh, and this is going to cost health systems, and we're going to have to think our way through this. And that's why we've always said since the beginning of this that even a mild or asymptomatic infection, please just avoid infection. The, the, the principle that, ah, it's only a mild infection, I don't mind if I get it. If you're someone with post-COVID condition, <laughs> uh, I think people uh, will think very differently about knowingly exposing yourself to this virus. This is why the strategy has those two arms. I just want to reemphasize this. So we, we, we push so much to vaccination, to, to keep people alive, you know, prevent severe disease and death. But we are also pushing as part of this equation, these, these two major objectives is to reduce transmission. The level of intensity of spread, you know, we've got 507 million cases that have occurred worldwide that we know of. But if you look at seroprevalence, you actually look at unrecognized infection as we measure with antibodies in the body. Far, far more people have been exposed to this virus and infected at some point in this. I mean, hundreds of millions, um, billions at this point. Um, and so we need to take that into consideration. We have to lower the circulation 
not only because of future variant emergence, but also because of post-COVID-19 condition. And so it's really critical that we get this narrative correct. Saving people's lives and making sure that they get vaccinated, they get early access to clinical care, as well as reducing the spread for a number of reasons. To reduce the emergence of variants, but also to reduce the opportunity for people to, to develop long COVID. Thank you so much to both of you. And we have a, a follow-up question from Angel Torcielo. Uh, why is um, why are some people affected by the long COVID? And he's asking why we, why we actually he's saying we should know by now. Mm. It's, it's, a great, it's a great question. Um, we don't have the full answer to this yet. Um, we have an entire, with, within WHO um, and with partners around the world, we have an entire program of work um, to ensure that we get answers to this. Um, that's the right question. Why some and why not others? You know, what is the mechanism, the biology behind this that, that's actually uh, affecting people and why are some people dealing with long COVID and others not? Um, and what we are working towards with medical professionals across many different organs of the body, with adult uh, clinicians and pediatrics, um, making sure that we have the studies that are underway to get answers to that question. Um, and importantly, while we are getting those answers, and you're right, I think you know, we agree we should have those answers already, but we don't have the complete picture yet. At the same time, while that research is underway in a number of countries around the world, and we're grateful for partners who are following cohorts of individuals with long COVID, adults and children, we also need to ensure that people get the care that they need now, even before we have the answers. Even if we don't know the why yet, we still know that people are dealing with many different long-term effects. How do we ensure that patients get the care that they need now through rehabilitation, through treatment, through, through care, wherever they are in the spectrum of their disease. And this also includes long COVID. So your, Angel is, is highlighting that there's much more work to be done. And I think this is part of the legacy of what we need to discuss as we talk about this pandemic. This pandemic um, requires us at the World Health Organization, as well as our partners, to maintain vigilance. This is what we mean by this, it's focus. You know, keeping up the focus, keeping up the attention to make sure that the research continues, to make sure that there's financing for this research, because as everybody moves on to the next challenge, we also run the risk of not having the finances to carry out this research, and that's really, really critical. So, and hell, I'm sorry, there's just more work to be done for us to get a proper answer to that question. Thank you so much, Maria. And here's a question from uh, Patricia, who says that COVID is very much still with us. Some countries have no vaccinations and are in a worse situation than Europe. Uh, so maybe we can uh, tell what's the situation currently with, with vaccination rates across the world as we have the target that uh, WHO has set uh, for 70% of populations in every country to be vaccinated by, by mid-2020. Um, so far we are not on track to reach the target. Some countries reached it, uh, I think 52 at the moment, uh, but majority uh, developed and high income countries. So what is the situation in, in low and lower income countries? Mike, maybe do you want to start? Do you have it in front of you? I haven't, mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to use my cheat sheets because in so many Please different numbers. Problem. You have it? Which? Yeah. The, the numbers um, of vaccination. I'll, no, I'll, I thought yeah. you were gonna answer that okay. <laughs> All right, so it, it, the reason we need these, you know, as I just mentioned, sort of cheat sheets, is because it's, it's quite a dynamic situation. And the use of vaccines, we've had more than 11.6 billion doses of vaccines administered globally. Um, and it, about 13 million are being administered on a daily basis, which is really quite incredible. But this is down from, from where we were previously. Um, as you mentioned, 52 countries have vaccinated more than 70% of, of their population, and this is the target that we are reaching, but it varies drastically um, across regions. If we look at our um, low-income countries, if we look, you know, um, their vaccination status, if we look at how much of the population has been vaccinated, it's, it's really quite, low-income countries is about 12% of populations, and that's exceedingly low. Um, given if you look at how many billions of people we're actually talking about in low-income countries. Um, so it very, it's, it's, it's still quite unfair, and it's about access, it's about use, it's about making sure that, that countries are able to actually administer those. And, and we're working through our COVAX partners and working in countries through our regional offices, our country offices with our partners to ensure that that number increases, but it's still, it's still far too low. And there's still further inequities when you look at 
Vaccinate. You'd imagine vaccination and health workers mm -hmm. at this point would be a no-brainer. We should have every health worker in the world vaccinated. They're in the front line. They're exposed all the time. And, and if you go to the likes of uh, uh, Europe uh, or, or Southeast Asia or the Western Pacific, you're talking 85, 90, 95 percent, up to 100 percent vaccinated health workers. If you go to Africa, it's 47 percent. Less than half health workers in Africa are protected with vaccination. It just blows my mind. It's just unbelievable uh, that that is the case two and a half years in. Uh, so it, it's those statistics. Uh, and also when you look inside the statistics at the, uh, at the age distributions, it's amazing. In every single region, there are still pockets of people at high risk not vaccinated, regardless of the country. There are still high risk people with underlying conditions. There are still very elderly people who are not fully vaccinated. This just, uh, again, we want to reach that 70%. We want to distribute vaccines across the board. We want as many people vaccinated as possible. That will help to reduce severity. It will help reduce hospitalization. It will help to reduce transmission. And there's increasing data to show that the vaccines do, you know, they're not perfect at stopping transmission, but they're much better than uh, doing nothing. Uh, and it can, if you add them to basic protective measures and, and other things that we do, that can be very effective. So I do think uh, there's, um, uh, I think uh, we have, I don't know, 69 or 70 member states still below 40% coverage. That's, that's one third of our member states. Uh, it's, uh, I hate using the statistics, but you, you read them and you look at them and you don't believe them and you say, no, it can't be, it just can't be, uh, but it is. Uh, and it's not through a lack of effort. Uh, there are still supply issues, but there are also now logistic and delivery issues at country level. So we're working really hard uh, through the delivery partnership to increase the uptake of vaccines at country level. But uh, again, countries, you know, it's very tough for countries in the lower income brackets because when everybody else was getting vaccines, when the, the pandemic was raging and everyone wanted vaccines, they weren't getting vaccines. They were just watching people in the industrialized north getting vaccines. And now the vaccines are becoming available, the disease, there's less attention to the disease. So you can't blame people in the south for being a bit hesitant, saying, well, now you want us to take the vaccine. You wouldn't give us the vaccine when the disease was killing thousands and thousands of people every day. And now that you're saying the, the pandemic is over, because you're now all declaring the pandemic is over, now you want us to take the vaccines? Can you imagine the messaging, how that can be misinterpreted, and you know this from your own social media world, Alex, or how misinformation can be developed and disinformation can be developed? Because we were very unfair in the beginning, and now we turn around and we say to poor people around the world, now, oh, no, now it's your turn. Hang on, hang on. I'm not sure I want your vaccine because you wouldn't give it to me when my kids were at risk or my parents were dying or my brother died and he didn't have a vaccine. You weren't around then and now you want to come and give me your vaccine now and you're telling the world that the pandemic's over and we're getting through, we're, we're through the pandemic phase and everything is fine now and please take the vaccine now. I'm not so sure I wouldn't be a bit cynical uh, in, in that setting and I think we need to recognize that that it's not just an issue of vaccine delivery. There are significant issues on vaccine hesitancy in countries now because of the unfairness that was demonstrated towards people in low-income countries before. Maybe I'm, you know, I don't have any particular data to support that position, but that's my sense from talking to people. That's my sense that uh, that unfairness has really led to a deep level of distrust. Uh, between people of the south and people of the north or people from low-income countries versus high-income countries. Because in, once again, I think, what's clear to people is the rich people get to set the rules. The rich people get to say who gets what. Uh, and I don't know how many times in a lifetime a person in a poor country or a poor person can actually take that kind of unfairness until they lose faith in the system entirely. It's just, to me, it just happens too often in life for most people, in poverty, uh, and people living in poor countries. Uh, but you, I, I can really feel that sense of uh, resentment and anger that comes now. Uh, and I still want people to take that vaccine because I know the benefit it can be. So it's a difficult thing for me because I'm still saying to people in that situation, please, I know it was unfair before. I know it was not done properly, and I know that you've lost people that you didn't need to lose. But right now, please, the vaccine is here, please take it. So it's hard to do that because you, you empathize, 
with the emotion that the person has, but you want them to take action and take the vaccine. So uh, I don't know if I'm explaining myself very well, Alex, but I, I do think we need to, people need to understand that we will continue to increase delivery of the vaccine. We'll continue to work with the government on logistics and cold chain and getting the vaccine to the last mile. But st people still have to want to come and take that vaccine. The, and we have to work harder at rebuilding trust with people that we mean what we say. Because we promised before and we didn't deliver. You know? Uh, and therefore, you can't come back a second time like the boy who cried wolf and say, oh, we're here now with these very important vaccines now that the pandemic is, inverted commas, over. Uh, so uh, I think it's something we're going to have to work much harder now to rebuild trust with people as to why they should continue to want to take this vaccine. Um, and I think it's a big challenge for us in terms of communications and trust building in the coming months. Thank you so much, Mike. We, we have a follow-up question from uh, Dr. Khan Aga Logarai. Uh, why has WHO set 70% as a target for vaccination against COVID-19? Uh, I won't go into the numbers <laughs> behind the numbers, but when, when you, um, when you look at the target populations in terms of age group and you look at the, uh, at the it's not an epidemiologic number in the sense that 70% was, is not a number aimed at stopping transmission. People say, well, why is it 70%? We know and we increasingly learned over time based on the transmission dynamics of the virus that you have to have much higher levels of vaccination. And even now, because of the, the breakthrough infections and because the virus doesn't perfectly prevent reinfection, it's very hard to think of any percentage of vaccination that would completely stop transmission. But the 70% was a number that would, would assure us that if we vaccinated 70% of the population and within that 70%, uh, the maximum number of vulnerable people, people, older age groups, people with underlying conditions, that that would bring to an end the acute phase of the pandemic. That would stop the deaths, that would stop the overwhelmed hospitals, that would bring our societies back to life. So in that sense, it is an arbitrary number, uh, but the number has an underlying calculation and has an underlying meaning. But the number wasn't the golden number, vaccinate 70% and the pandemic disappears. That was not the intention of the number, but we needed a goal. We needed to aim the world at a reasonable goal, at a goal that would be fair, at a goal that would ensure that everyone that needed a vaccine in every country would have got one. That was the number. We started out at 20%, then we went to 40%. Then we, we didn't you know, say at the very beginning, it has to be 70 or 100% from the beginning. There was a recognition that there was an equity. And WHO and the partners in COVAX focused on trying to get to the most vulnerable first. And then as we began to reach the most vulnerable, to expand that up to get to more people and more people. So this has been a sequential set of goals that have been, in some senses, you have to reach. They're a goal that you try to reach. You might not necessarily get to that goal. Um, my grandfather used to say to me, if you aim for the stars, you'll hit the roof. So, <laughs> and there's an element of aspiration to that. There is good data underneath. There's good sound mathematical basis for it. But ultimately, we needed to get the whole world focused on a goal. And within that goal, to make sure we had the most vulnerable vaccinated. So that, that's the reason for the number. But again, don't misinterpret that. 70% is not the number at which the pandemic disappears. Not at all. So it's 70% of all populations in all countries, not 70% of the world. And that's, a, that's a, an important difference because we have to make sure, as we keep saying, you have to make sure that they're the right individuals. To end this acute phase of this pandemic, to end the emergency, we take the death and devastation out of COVID. And we can do that with these vaccines. We can do that with early clinical care. Vaccines remain one of the most important tools that we can use. And having a global goal for a global pandemic, you know, a global problem is, is needed. Um, and I think we saw in the beginning such solidarity coming around. You hear the DG talk use the word solidarity all the time. We don't have that same level of solidarity right now because some people have reached that, you know, reached this, what they're calling the end of their emergency, but it hasn't ended everywhere. So everybody should be still fighting for this target, this goal, this benchmark, and we need to increase it. Um, it's a minimum. It's not just 70% and we're done, as Mike has just said. It's 70% and then what else can we do? Are we at 100% of our over 60s, over 70s, over 80 year old? Are we at 100% of those with underlying conditions of any age? Are we at 100% of our frontline workers? No, and we're far from it. 
So these statistics that we monitor, we benchmark ourselves and our work against, has to, we have to continue to look at that. And when one country reaches that 70%, they're not done. They have to continue to make sure that they reach those at most at risk. So global goals are a good thing. Um, and you'll, you'll keep hearing us, you know, try to reach that and work with our partners to ensure that we reach that in all countries. Thank you so much, Maria and, and Mike, of course. And uh, as we're talking about vaccination and this week we mark World Immunization Week, uh, Mike, maybe we can also reflect on other disease outbreaks that WHO is responding at the moment that could be prevented by vac high vaccination coverage. Um, yeah, no, it, 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 it's a good point and we do have, um, I mean, first, first thing to say is uh, immunization is the single most effective public health tool that we've probably ever developed. It's, it's an amazing technology. It goes back three or four hundred years, but the technology, uh, its application around the world has literally saved millions and millions and millions of lives over the, over the decades. Um, and we continue to see innovation. Uh, you know, most recently with new Ebola vaccines, which are vectored vaccines, and now we have the mRNA vaccines. So we're seeing an explosion in new technologies uh, for vaccination. Um, and um, we're seeing huge innovation in the space. But we're still seeing a tremendous um, amount of underutilization of vaccines um, uh, in the world, or uh, an under-vaccination. So I'll give you a, a good example. I think uh, measles, a disease of childhood that we shouldn't really see anymore. We have the possibility to eliminate or eradicate measles, and yet we've seen nearly an 80% increase uh, in the last two months of measles cases around the world. We have 21 large and disruptive measles outbreaks in the last year, and they're affecting countries like Somalia and Yemen and Nigeria and Afghanistan and Ethiopia. And you can see this association between these infectious diseases and conflict and instability. Because what happens in conflict and instability is what gets what, what gets uh, problem, what the problem is going to be that you're going to have no vaccinations, no immunization campaigns, they add COVID into that and we've seen so many um, immunization campaigns postponed or delayed because of COVID and lockdowns. Um, for example, if you look at Ukraine, Ukraine was supposed to do a measles ketchup campaign in 2019. It got postponed because of COVID and obviously has now been postponed again because of the conflict. So we're now in a situation where we haven't had a ketchup campaign, we're three years behind the curve in a country in which we've six and a six point seven million displaced people we've got four and a half million five million refugees and we've got maybe 10 million people living in the conflict zone uh, measles for those of you out there is for a lot of people in the industrialized north measles people remember measles as a mild childhood disease measles is not a mild disease measles is a lethal disease it's a lethal disease and a malnourished, stressed child living in a refugee camp. It will take life, and it will take life really quickly. Um, and the fact that we have a, a massively effective vaccine that's cheap and available, and the fact that we're not using that vaccine effectively enough because of weaknesses in health systems, because of conflict, because of misinformation, and because of disinformation, is a real tragedy. Uh, you, I've seen too many kids die right in front of me from measles and that for people in, again in the north that's not something people experience but it, it is it is a savage disease in in a compromised individual uh, and we have the ability to stop it and you know what we've seen is the what can be done how close we can get to eliminating measles we've seen that with the elimination of polio in most regions of the world were close to eradication disease that was the scourge of humanity going back to the days of the ancient egyptians We've managed to almost wipe polio off the face of the earth using vaccination. We did that with smallpox. We, that smallpox was killed millions of people every year all around the world, right up into the 1960s. It's gone. The disease is no longer with us. It's locked down in two labs in, in, in Russia and in, in the United States um, as historical samples. But uh, uh, the disease doesn't exist in nature anymore because we got rid of it using vaccines. Uh, we do have ongoing outbreaks of yellow fever, of cholera, of meningitis right across uh, Africa at the moment and uh, they're all vaccine preventable. We need and we should be vaccinating more people against yellow fever within the immunization, normal immunization program. We don't do that and then we end up having to do these huge reactive campaigns. 
Meningitis, many of you have seen meningitis. It is a lethal disease everywhere that it occurs, particularly bacterial meningitis. We have a strategy to eliminate meningitis as a public health problem by 2030. We have a strategy similar for cholera, for yellow fever. But at the centre of those strategies, the central pillar of the strategy is effective immunisation. Um, our colleagues, and uh, you know, we have. I, I, we don't work in the immunization program. We have many immunization <laughs> activities, especially in the emergencies program, as we are reacting all the time to emergencies. So preemptive vaccination and reactive vaccination to outbreaks is a big part of what we do. But the real heroes, uh, and you'll see that, and very often there'll be press and media around these big outbreak response campaigns, you know, where you go in with the Ebola vaccine and you vaccinate against Ebola, and everyone covers that because it's, it's news. The real heroes of vaccination are the community health workers, mainly women, who go out every single day and they vaccinate millions of kids in every town and every village and every clinic and every household around the world. And they literally protect the planet every single day in the work they do. They don't get the hero status because they're not jumping out of helicopters and they're not wearing PPE and they don't look like astronauts most of the time, right? But they're the real heroes because it's that ability to deliver that vaccine to the last mile to that child, to give a child a full course of protective vaccination that protects them for life against some of the most devastating, awful diseases you can imagine. We don't see them as awful anymore in the north because we don't see them anymore because they're diseases of the past in the main because we're vaccinated. And yet we allow millions of children to experience those diseases every year for the sake of a vaccine that costs a couple of cents in some cases, or a health system that just requires a community health worker who's paid next to nothing to go to a house and vaccinate that child with the simplest of equipment. It's the, simply the best investment we have ever made in public health. And unfortunately at the moment, we, for fortunately we still have a brilliant infrastructure around the world for doing that with our partners in UNICEF, in Gavi and in other organizations, NGOs and others. There's a tremendous commitment to vaccination at community level, with civil society, with uh, health medical nursing organizations. But unfortunately, uh, conflict and instability and hesitancy and misinformation and disinformation is challenging the success of vaccines. Uh, uh, and therefore, we have to redouble our efforts. We have to recommit ourselves, I believe, uh, I've been a cheerleader for vaccination now because I, <laughs> coming from the emergency side, I see, we see the impact of epidemics that occur because of lack of vaccination. Uh, but I'm not saying invest in better epidemic response, I'm saying invest in better prevention. Prevent these epidemics by vaccinating people in the right place, at the right time, for the right disease, using the right vaccines. because. That's the, simply the best investment we can make in health security that I can imagine. And uh, my gratitude goes out to all those health workers around the world who vaccinated all those kids, and my kids in the past, your kids, Maria. You know, the, the, they really are the heroes, uh, but they're unseen in our communities. Uh, so the next time you go to the GP's office or you go to the clinic and you see a nurse or a practitioner or a community health worker vaccinating the child, just go over and say thank you to them because they're protecting a whole generation so much Mike and uh, speaking of all these uh, as you said uh, conflict and uh, very complex settings uh, we received a question about uh, situation in Ukraine and uh, in particular in the context of COVID-19 pandemic how has this conflict impact the epidemiological situation there? Um, well quite frankly we don't know because one of the things that suffered in this whole process has been the testing process uh, for um, for uh, COVID-19 um, and therefore we don't have a full uh, we don't have a full picture uh, on the the situation with COVID-19 we do know that only about 34 percent of people one in three people were vaccinated before the conflict began we know that with the displacement with overcrowding uh, that the situation can't be have resolved itself and uh, for most people, they have a lot more to worry about right now than COVID, right? But when you look at the, particularly, the, I'm concerned about the displaced population. There's about seven and a half million people displaced inside Ukraine. They're not, the refugees are out of the country, but many of them have been access to vaccination. They've had access to health services. They've had access to support services. The displaced people inside Ukraine not necessarily have had access to the same level of service. And if you look at those households and the, uh, the, uh, the uh, IOM, 
have done a series of excellent sort of surveys on these displaced populations and credit to them for the work they've done. But when you look inside those displaced households, the number of households that have elderly people, people with underlying conditions, uh, young children, pregnant women, you know that these households have, I have never seen such a profile of vulnerability. There are so many vulnerabilities in these households of displaced individuals where there's so many chronic needs, not just acute needs, it's not an acute nutrition crisis, but what you have is hundreds, thousands of older people with underlying conditions who may not have access to their diabetes or hypertension medication. In a situation like that, if someone like is exposed to COVID, they have potential to have a very severe um, infection. So um, from that perspective, uh, again, we thank the surrounding countries for making arrangements for testing and for vaccination for those individuals. We have done a lot of work in providing emergency medical teams into Ukraine to support the system. We have provided medical oxygen and continue to provide a lot of supplies across the whole of Ukraine with our partners uh, across the whole system. We've done a lot of training on respiratory virus disease management, trauma management, and other types of severe disease management. So we've tried to go in there and provide the best support we can, uh, but uh, it's, it's not an easy environment to have to work in. So as regards COVID, there's been almost no vaccination ongoing inside uh, and uh, almost no testing. So it's very hard for us to determine just how bad the COVID situation is. But there's so many other bad things happening I think you have to put this into a hierarchy of need. What do people need in Ukraine, what they need? And I think the DG said it a few weeks ago, the best medicine right now in Ukraine is peace. Uh, we can sort all the other problems out. We can sort out COVID there. We can sort out the other issues. We can get the hospitals back on track. We can get the vaccination programs back on track. And we can do that reasonably quickly. And we can support Ukraine, but it is almost impossible to do that in the middle of multiple shooting wars going on at the same time within the same country. Uh, so peace is the only solution that's going to give us a reasonable chance to provide adequate aid and assistance to the people of Ukraine. Thank you so much, Mike. And uh, Maria, maybe before we close, um, a question for you from Elizabeth. Are we winning against COVID-19 and its variants, or is it the other way around? Oh. It's a great question to, to wrap up with. I love how you ask these questions right at the end. Um, I think there's a different situation in, in different countries. I think we have the tools to overcome this virus, to win against this virus. Um, but it's the virus is not alive, um, but it is quite a slick virus in terms of its ability to mutate, which is, which is um, something we have expected since the beginning. It's a natural process for virus changing. Um, I think we are smarter than this virus. We have the tools that could bring it to its knees. And again, please don't write to me and tell me that the virus is not alive. I know that, but we're just using an analogy here in the sense that um, we can overcome it and we can win against it. Um, I think the fact that we are seeing a significant decline in morbidity and mortality, hospitalizations, the need for oxygen, the need to be ventilated, the, and people dying, that means we are winning against this virus. But we can't be complacent. In the beginning of this pandemic, I don't know about you, Mike, but I, I got the question of, you know, what keeps you up at night? What are you most concerned about? And for me, for the longest time, and still is, it's complacency. Um, even though we may be winning against this virus now, we still have to keep up the fight, if you will, um, because we can and because we have these tools at hand. So um, we're in a much, much better position we were in in the beginning. But again, right now, the challenge is finding the balance of using these tools against all of the other challenges that we face, which are significant. There's wars, there's conflict, there's um, displacement, there are other diseases that people are dying from that are preventable. So we have to put the right emphasis in there, but we shouldn't give up. Um, you know, people are, when they say that the emergency is over, that the pandemic is over, that the virus has now become endemic, it's an excuse. Some are using it as an excuse to say, we give up, we give up the fight. We just have to learn to live with it. We are living with this virus. We just need to do it more responsibly. So I think we are winning against the virus. I think we just have to keep it up. And we are certainly not winning against this virus in all countries. And that's because countries don't have access to these tools. And it is about equity, it's about fairness. This is the right thing to do ethically. It's the right thing to do epidemiologically. It's the right thing to do economically. So we need to do much more 
to continue to win against this virus, and we need to make sure that all countries have the tools that they need to actually beat this virus down. And we're not there yet. So there's a lot more that needs to be done in terms of equity, in terms of fairness, and in terms of using these tools. Yeah, to use the sports analogy, for those soccer fans out there, it's probably the most popular sport in the world. It's like winning 3-2, 20 minutes to go in the game. Uh, we don't know if the opposition is going to bring on some really impact substitutes like a new variant, and we have no idea how much extra time there's going to be. So would any of you out there uh, want to predict victory with those set of parameters? And that's where I feel right now. We are winning, but we're winning before the game has ended. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there's no guarantee of victory. Game's not and over. we're winning when the opposition hasn't fully deployed all of its potential uh, powers or its potential capacities. Uh, and we're winning without understanding how long we're going to have to win for because we don't know how much extra time. So I, I, I do like to think that we are winning. We're certainly winning the clinical battle and saving lives. Yeah. Um, and, and we're winning the battle in terms of protecting the most vulnerable in terms of getting people vaccinated so they're protected against hospitalization and death. There's no question on that. Mm. We're just not winning equally everywhere. We're not giving, the score in the game is not the same in every country. And the score in the game is not the same for everybody in every country. And there's still a huge issue at the center of this pandemic. Uh, uh, marginalization, exclusion, and lack of access across a range of issues, not just to the vaccine, to antivirals, to mm -hmm. tests, to basic clinical care, to, to basic accommodation, to information, mm -hmm. to nutrition. All of these things have been inequitable in this pandemic. And this pandemic has uncovered so many of these inequities. And the fact that if you are living in a society where you are marginalized for one thing, you're likely to be marginalized for many things, and you're likely to be on the bad end of a COVID experience because of all of that marginalization. So if we're ready to address the issues in COVID for the future, yes, we have to address immunization for the future and we have to address how we do research and development and how we do surveillance and all these things and we're working on that right now on how to build better systems for the future but if we're really going to go into the next possible threat of a pandemic with our systems as so deeply unfair as they are now with our health systems completely distorted towards the wealthy and the well-off and away from the people who really need health care and health protection which are people who are living in poverty and living in marginalized conditions, then we're going to make the same mistakes over and over and over again. Uh, the, the principle of infectious diseases is very clear. We're all susceptible. Uh, Detras keeps saying it, you know, uh, we're only, we're, we're, you cannot leave anyone behind, not because it's a moral principle, but it's a scientific principle. You, you, at your peril in an epidemic situation, mm -hmm. Do you leave pockets of people unprotected? It's, it's, it's just, it, it makes no moral sense, but it makes no epidemiologic sense. So I do think we're winning, but I do think if you look inside every country, you will still see clear examples of where people within a given community or a society or communities within an overall country are still not winning. Mm -hmm. And that's a real tragedy uh, because we're declaring victory for the whole while some still suffer. Uh, both in and between countries, and that's not fair, and we have to reflect on that, you know. Thank you so much to both of you. This was really excellent discussion and uh, intelligence shared with our viewers as always. I'm thanking them for watching us from Turkey, Saudi Arabia, India, the US, Chad, Malawi, France, Morocco, Lesotho, Cuba, Australia, Tunisia, Nepal, Ethiopia, New Zealand, Algeria, Austria, and Pakistan, and many others. The, long, the list is long. Uh, thank you so much, uh, and until next week, please stay safe.